Okay, what we had been doing was partial differential equation boundary value problems in different coordinate systems, not rectangular coordinate systems. We did some polar coordinate cases. I accidentally called them cylindrical coordinates and I shouldn't have, they were polar coordinates. But now we are gonna do cylindrical, cylindrical coordinates. Um, let's take this, this would be a vibrating membrane in rectangular coordinates. Um, before we only did a one dimensional, it was a vibrating string. But if it were a vibrating membrane, you know, two dimensional and moving in time, this would be the guiding equation. But what if it's a round drum? Your membrane is a round drum. Or we're gonna like cap it or something and it will vibrate. Um, then we need to convert this to um, cylindrical coordinates. <clears throat> Excuse me, that means the X is R cosine theta, the Y is R sine theta, and the third variable in this case is just P e for time. Um, you go through the pain of uh, partial derivatives in the chain rule. This equation becomes this equation in cylindrical coordinates. And we'll say that on the outs, outer edge of this membrane, out where the radius is some fixed radius C, the radius of the drum head, um, out at that edge, we'll say it's held at a, at a vertical height of zero. So, so U is the vertical height. Um, well, you could separate the ODEs as we normally do. I'll go through this in two dimensions. You would get three ordinary differential equations. Look, we have three variables here. We end up with three ordinary differential equations. And without going through it, here's the solution to those three guys in general. Um, I'm not gonna go through this. This is too hard. What we're gonna do is a two dimensional version of this problem by assuming radial symmetry. And that means it's the same height for any theta. So here's the height at this point. It's the same height all the way around for the same theta, given the same <coughs> R and T. <laughs> so we're going to eliminate theta from the equations. And we're just left with this equation. So here's the governing partial differential equation. The radius of this membrane goes from zero out to some fixed C. And time is greater than zero. Something happens at time zero. And then after time greater than zero, that's what we're solving. The vertical height is held at zero out of this outer edge, or R equals C. Here we have initial conditions. At time zero, there's an initial vertical displacement for each R, each you know, radius from the center, and and also an initial vertical speed or velocity rather um, for each R. So those are our explicit boundary conditions. Um, so let's go through and separate variables like we did before. We assume U is a function of the two functions of the individual variables themselves. So it's some big R, some big T, these are functions. R is a little function, little R, big T is a only a little t. Um, you also separate the boundary condition, especially this, this zero case. This means that r evaluated at little c times the big t function zero. The only way to make that zero for all t is if r is 
argument of C zero. So that's our boundary condition on the R. Let's let's keep continuing with this uh, separation of variables product method. U is RT. So second derivative with respect to R is R double prime T. It's one over R, R prime T. And on the right side, you would have R T double prime. So this is rewriting the original equation in the separated variables. So now we do some algebra. We'll divide both sides by A squared R T. We get this. Now they're separated. All R stuff on this side, all T stuff on that side. We set them equal to the same separating constant. And now we get two ordinary differential equations. Here's the T equation. It looks pretty close to what we've seen before. It's standard second order case. Here's the R equation. If I multiply through by R squared and get it all on one side, I get this. This is a new equation that we've seen in solving partial differential equations, but it's actually a Bessel equation of order zero. So we know the general solutions to these two guys. This is gonna be that cosine sine uh, could be cosh and singe, et cetera. And this is going to be, well, at least for positive lambda, it's going to be uh, uh, the vessel functions of the first and second kind. For now, we're only going to look at positive eigenvalues, okay? I'll explain this more later, why we can do that. But if we restrict ourselves to this, let's see what happens. We'll say that that lambda equals alpha squared. Here's the R equation, which is a Bessel equation of R to zero, and it has this general solution, right? Bessel equations of the first kind and the second kind. Um, here's the T equation, and it has this known solution. Well, now we apply a boundedness or an implicit boundary condition. Boundedness. We saw that when we did full recording cases. The drum cannot go off to infinity. It has, it has to stay finite. Otherwise it, otherwise, it would perforate or something. So we restrict ourselves to finite or uh, bounded functions. This The D function is always bounded. Look at it. It's for lambda greater than zero. But look at the Bessel functions. Who graphs of those Bessel functions? We only need order zero here. And here it is. Here's a Bessel equation of order zero. This blue line here is bounded. Bessel function of the second kind goes unbounded as R approaches zero. And R equals zero is the center of our drum. That's where it and it has to be it has to be bounded over the range of our variables. And R goes from zero to C. So it has to be bounded at zero. So we reject these functions, meaning we'll set this little C2 to zero. And our R functions are just these uh, vessel functions of order zero of the first kind. Plus a function, function to the first kind of R to zero. Now we can apply the boundary condition. R at C, a little c was zero. And R at little c is this adjacent zero C that has to equal zero. That gives us our eigenvalue value generating relationship. And if you want to visualize what it is, every place this blue line crosses the x-axis, that x value is, is where alpha sub n c is. So the alpha sub n would be that value divided by whatever your c is. 
this would be the next one. There's going to be an infinite number of crossings. And anyway, that's that's where you get all these alpha cements. We're not going to calculate them. We'll say this is our eigenvalue generating relationship. There it is right there. So there's our eigenvalues, this alpha sub n squared. There's the eigenvalue generating relationship where we can put the alpha sub n. Eigenfunctions corresponding to that. Um, the key equation was this guy. So we're going to use the same alpha sub n. So our u for each individual n is just we multiply those two guys together. So here's the t part, here's the r part. Eigenvalue generating relationship. To get the total general solution, we add all these guys up over infinity. Here is the solution. But it doesn't match those initial conditions. It matches the implicit boundary condition of boundedness, and it matches the, uh, the outer edge having a height of zero. You'll need to find matches to the initial conditions. But we don't have the big A's and B's, but here's what the solution looks like. Uh, since we need the Derivative, we'll go ahead and take the derivative, and we're just taking derivatives of cosines and sines. That's easy enough. And the initial condition was where time equals zero. So this guy is going to be cosine is one, sine is zero. So this will just be a sub n j zero. And for the derivative, it will be this will be zero, it will be b n a alpha. So here's those two conditions, um, or here's what they are, and here's what they have to equal. The given function, which was the initial displacement, this given function, which was the initial vertical velocity. Um, what do we expand these guys with? We need, we need to expand these functions with functions that look like this. These are Bessel functions. Remember from way back, we had a way to do that. We called it the Fourier Bessel series. And uh, it depended on what your eigenvalue generating relationship was. You know, it was driven by the boundary condition. Here's that case I or case one. Here it is for a general Bessel equation of order N. We're gonna be doing it for a Bessel equation of order zero. But here's, here's how to expand such a function. This is your eigenvalue generating relationship. Here's the Fourier Bessel series, and here's how, do you, how you compute those coefficients. So we have ways to expand our functions f and our function g. Now we match coefficients like we usually do. This big a sub n has to equal these little c sub n. Have a formula for the little events from a. For the other condition, this big B sub n a alpha sub, all that has to equal these little c sub n's. This matching coefficients and like we've done multiple times. And so here's the summary of it. Here's what we had before, but now we have ways to compute the big A's and the big B's. Bottom from the Anyway, here's visualizations of what that vibrating membrane looks like over different slices of time. Um, we'll do more examples, and I'll and I'll come back to this example and explain why we could uh, reject negative lambdas in lambda equals zero. I'll cover that later.